Gen Z is the first generation that's been fully immersed in the digital age. Making fun of Zoomer culture through online videos, stand up, and film has become so abundant it's almost become a cliche. Is this Morgan Squad? Gang, gang. Believable portrayals of Gen Z characters are usually only in films that are also marketed towards a Gen Z audience. Films like Bodies, Bodies, Bodies or The Edge of Seventeen feel much more accurate than some SNL skit because they're not only poking fun at Gen Z slang, interests, and beliefs, but they're also empathizing with them. But nowhere is this cultural commentary done better than in Wes Craven's Scream 4. Coming off of a decade long break, Scream 4 opened to the poorest box office numbers in the franchise's history, and to this day is received worse critically than any other film in the franchise besides the third. Despite this, Scream 4 is often considered by fans of the franchise to be the best sequel, and truly ahead of its time. Not only did Scream 4 satirize the current horror genre and cultural zeitgeist like the previous films, but it also predicted some of the most influential aspects of modern society. In 2011, social media was mostly looked at as an innocuous way to communicate with friends and family. At the time, Yahoo was still more popular than YouTube, Twitch was still just Justin TV, and Instagram only had about 10 million users in total. The dark side of the internet and its potential for abuse and crime was still relatively unknown. Instances of hacking and cyberbullying were still common, but the public understanding of these issues was not as widespread or as well documented as it is today. Scream 4 opens with two friends talking about one's Facebook stalker who after being deleted, hacks their way back in and is pretending to be early 2000s Channing Tatum, or as the kids would say a couple years later, a catfish. Tragically, these two are killed in what is revealed to be the intro to Stab 6, another installment in the in-universe slasher franchise based on the murders depicted in the original Scream film, which these two are watching while arguing about modern horror films and social media. A fucking Facebook killer? You're kidding me, right? I guess now it would be Twitter. That make more sense. Well, it's also predictable. There's no element of surprise. You can see everything coming. <laughs> this is also revealed to just be the intro to Stab 7. Scream 4 arrived during a large wave of horror reboots, like Rob Zombie's Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street. These reboots aim to revitalize the classic horror franchises for a more modern audience, but Scream took a different approach. It didn't just reboot the series, instead it examined the cultural shifts that had occurred since the original Scream trilogy, like the emergence of social media and mid-2000s celebrity culture, where many of the biggest stars on the planet are only famous for being famous. Famous. After the opening, we're reintroduced to our protagonist, Sydney Prescott, and her new publicist who are currently stopped in her hometown of Woodsboro to promote her new book. The release of this book coincides with the 15 year anniversary of the Woodsboro murders. We're also introduced to Sydney's cousin Jill, her friend Kirby, and her neighbor Olivia. Jill's parallels with Sydney immediately start to form. In the original film, Sydney has a complicated relationship with her boyfriend Billy because she's not ready to sleep with him. Billy turns out to be one of the killers. On their way to school, the girls gossip about Jill's ex who has been calling all of her friends to try and get in touch with her. The film is setting the stage for Jill to become the next protagonist of the franchise and to continue the legacy. She also gets a ghost face call from her classmate Jenny one of the girls that was murdered the night before in the opening scene. At Woodsboro High, we meet Robbie and Charlie, the presidents of the Woodsboro Cinema Club. And after news of the murders breaks and evidence is found in the back of Sydney's rental car, her publicist is ecstatic. Two girls butchered. <laughs> Payday. The town goes into lockdown and the girls who receive the phone call are called in for questioning, where they're told that nobody can leave town because everybody's a suspect. That night back at her house, Jill is surprised to find her ex Trevor climbing into her bedroom window, once again furthering the parallels with Sydney. What? Nothing, you just, uh, you remind me of, uh, me. After Kirby comes over to stay the night, they receive another phone call from Ghostface, this time from Trevor's number. After telling Kirby that he was in the closet, the girls watch in horror as he jumps out of Olivia's closet next door. Sydney and Jill run over to the house and find Olivia's body. Jill gets stabbed, Ghostface escapes, and Trevor comes out of nowhere acting confused. What happened? Later at the hospital, Sydney fires her publicist after learning how excited she is that people are being murdered, revealing that she didn't even read Sydney's book and attempting to sell Sydney on a Good Morning America appearance. The publicist is later thrown off a parking garage. The next day, Sydney and Gail Weathers, the journalists from the first three films, show up as guest speakers at Woodsboro Cinema Club. When Sydney asks Robbie about his headset, he makes a pretty accurate prediction. This, you film your entire high school experience and what, post it on the net? 
Everybody will be doing it someday soon. This was filmed in 2010. Although kids aren't walking around with massive headsets, streaming and vlogging culture has exploded in the years following the film's release. Even if you have the most generic lifestyle, there's an audience that is willing to watch your daily life. They also say that the natural next step for innovation would be for the killer to film their own murders. It's kind of the one component the killer is missing. Wait, what do you mean? Well, if you want to be the new, new version, the killer should be filming the murders. Yeah, it's like the natural next step in a psycho slasher innovation. I mean, you film them all real time, and then before you get caught, you upload them into cyberspace. Making your art as immortal as you. In the years following this film's release, this has become too familiar. Every couple of months, there's a new headline about some live killing spree. It's gotten so popular, the term live stream crime has its own wiki page, and these mass shootings have become gamified, with online posters alluding to the shooter's kill counts and trying to beat them. In just May of this year, a mass shooter that killed eight people in Texas scheduled a YouTube video to be released on the same day of the shooting. In the video, he's wearing a scream mask. While this is certainly a coincidence, it's a very dark one. In the movie, it's revealed that the killer is recording the murders, which Gail finds out at the annual Stabathon when she discovers a webcam watching over the party before she herself gets attacked. After Ghostface calls Sydney, informs her about Gail, and insinuates he's going after Sydney's family, she runs to check on Jill, who has snuck out of the house to go with Kirby. Jill's mother and Sydney get attacked, resulting in Jill's mother's death, and the high school gang all meet up back at Kirby's place, whose parents are out of town, obviously. Trevor shows up saying Jill texted him, which she denies. Jill leaves to go find her phone, Robbie takes a walk, and Trevor and Charlie disperse after an awkward interaction. While live streaming Robbie is butchered, Jill comes downstairs with her phone telling Kirby that she never texted Trevor. Sydney comes to get Jill, but before they can leave, they get attacked by Ghostface. After the usual fight shenanigans, the group gets split up and Sydney and Kirby hide in her basement where they find Charlie, refuse to let him in, and then he too gets attacked. After a trivia game, Kirby manages to save Charlie's life, only for him to stab Kirby in the stomach for never noticing him in high school until senior year. Truly an inspirational moment for incels everywhere. After being attacked by Charlie, Sydney gets stabbed in the stomach from the other ghost face. Hello, Sydney. Surprised? Watch this. This is the part, my dear cousin, when the cameras turn off. The duo revealed that they've been recording all the kills and plan on uploading them later to frame Trevor, who after it's revealed that he cheated on Jill with one of the girls from the opening scene. You think you had a shitty boyfriend, Sydney? Here's one that fucks you, dumps you, and doesn't even make you famous. Shouldn't have killed all those people, Trev. Gone and put it on video even. But it means a lot that you did it for me. What the fuck are you talking about? I am not the girl. You cheat is shot in the head. Until now, in all of the Scream films, all the mastermind killers have had the same motive, revenge. In Scream, it was for Billy's mom abandoning him after his dad had an affair with Sydney's mother. In Scream 2, it was Billy's mom who decided to get revenge for the death of a son that she never saw. And in Scream 3, it was Sydney's half-brother upset that their mother abandoned him. But Scream 4's motive was very different. Do you know what it was like growing up in this family? Related to you? I mean, all I ever heard was Sydney this and Sydney that and Sydney, Sydney, Sydney. You were always just so fucking special. Well, now I'm the special one. In a bid for fame, Jill recorded all of her own murders and even murders her own partner so she can be the sole survivor. The film received criticism from many for being predictable and unrealistic, but in the attention economy era of today where narcissists will do anything for recognition, including things that they know could land them decades in a prison cell, is this really still that far off? If you saw a headline tomorrow reading friends fall victim to TikTokers fame seeking murder spree, would you still think that's wildly unbelievable? Or would you just go, damn, that's crazy and move on? And while there are many films critiquing Gen Z's addiction to social media, like Spree where a live streaming Uber driver goes on a murder spree, or Not Okay where a girl gets caught up faking Instagram travel photos and then has to pretend that she's a surviving victim of a terrorist attack, I don't think any of them have Top Screen 4, which was made almost a decade earlier. The film has aged incredibly well. Even your friends. My friends? What world are you living in? I don't need friends. I need fans. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Go to college, grad school, work, 
Even if you still find the motive to be unrealistic, its foresight on influencer culture, live streaming, and Gen Z's attention economy can't be understated. The motive of being in the shadows of a more famous relative even plays into the casting decisions, with the killers being Emma Roberts and Rory Culkin, two actors who will probably never live up to the careers of their more accomplished relatives. Everybody wants to be famous, but nobody wants to buy a course. I took $10,000 worth of courses and put everything I learned into one 20 minute video that you can watch by clicking on the screen now. Shit's all fucked up. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We out here.